Hello, and welcome to Esther's Gardening Adventures. I'm Esther, and boy, do I have a lot to catch you up on since I last filmed. So last I filmed, I was heading out of town for a week or so. That was actually about two weeks ago. I came back last week, I filmed some things, and then I had a glitch in the memory card for my camera that destroyed the whole card. Uh, so I have a new memory card, which means I have plenty of space for recording new stuff, but I lost a lot of the footage. I'd recorded of returning back to the garden, but I can still give you an update on how the garden is going and just overall what's happened since I last filmed. So first of all, a couple days ago, a few days ago, we had a power outage. Um, there was a huge thunderstorm, lightning storm. I was actually uh, on a one day work trip coming back from New York City uh, on the train and I got a text message from Pepco, the utility company in this area saying, power may be out in your area. <laughs> Um, and then that was on a Tuesday and the power did not come back on till Thursday night. Luckily, the deep freezer we have was full of frozen, mostly meat uh, that I get from the farmer's market, but also other things. And the more full your freezer is, the longer it can kind of st stay cold. Um, so we put ice packs in the refrigerator because we had to open the fridge a couple times to get things out. And we didn't touch the deep freeze and Everything turned out fine. Um, everything survived, we didn't have to toss anything out. So that was really great. But I had actually just purchased a pressure canner, which is different than water bath canning. You can pressure can things for um, that are low acid and, and save them like beans, potatoes, meats, things like that if you're not pickling them. I haven't used it yet and it's very detailed. Uh, and I have a uh, really nice, instruction book that's very thick with recipes and everything on how to use the Presto pressure canner. But you know, this outage really got me thinking. We still had gas. So I have a gas fired range stove. So we still had gas, so we could still cook things. And of course I have a ton of candles and we still had uh, water. We still had running water. So we were able to do a lot of things you couldn't if, if all the systems went down, right? But it did get me thinking about preserving more, um, how I'm very glad I already am sort of headed in the direction of self um, so preserving and saving things myself. But uh, I already wanted to do this, but <laughs> I went to the uh, farmer's market this weekend. I wanted to grow green beans this year enough to can, and I just never got around to planting enough green beans um, to really do anything big with them. So I went to the farmer's market and I bought probably, I think it was about six pounds of green beans. These are just some leftover ones I threw in. Um, but about six pounds of green beans. I'm not supposed to touch the others. Uh, but we got three quarts or yeah, three quarts and one, two, three, four, five pints of green beans. And it's my grandma's dilly bean recipe, which is based off the ball canning book. But um, she includes cayenne pepper. I don't know if the ball canning book includes that. <laughs> um, and so dilly beans are something I grew up with. I love eating. Um, and I have garlic from my own garden in here. I have dill from my own garden in here. And while the beans aren't from my garden, you know, I was able to help, my garden was able to help provide for this. I also wanted to show you, I bought, I didn't measure it, but I bought a ton of sour cherries. Oh my gosh, it's heavy. You can see how much this is. Oh, it's a lot that uh, I'm hoping to process and make things with. I had a moment of panic. I'm gonna talk to you as I go about everything that's going on. I had a moment of panic because I couldn't find my cherry pitter. This thing I got one day when I was, maybe like seven years ago when I was at an orchard. They were selling it for like five bucks. And all you do is you put it on your jar, any old regular sized opening canning jar, and then you just take a cherry, you can face it in any direction, but I'm facing it down here. These are already rinsed. And look at this. Oh, <laughs> See, we have two pits in there now. So you can just do that uh, for pitting. There's two in them because I already gave my husband one. One of the pitted ones. But you can just pit them so much easier with this cherry pitter. It really is just makes life so much easier. It's been a couple of days since I filmed that clip. And since then I have gone through and finally canned all of those cherries up. I tell you what, I can't believe how much work that takes. I was really amazed. I made uh, cherry pie filling as well as tart cherry jam. 
tart cherry jam. And man, I have a, such a respect for anyone who does canning. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get through, especially something thick where uh, for the pie filling, uh, I used a recipe on the Melissa Norris page that included the use of clear gel, which is a modified cornstarch that is able to last in canning as a thickener. Um, and boy, that stuff is like stirring thick molasses. <laughs> it takes so much energy. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy and proud to have these done. And obviously, I want to can things that can be used for everyday use that aren't just sugary um, or pickle. My plan is to uh, do more canning of meat and potatoes, potentially canning, pressure canning some soups. It really is important to me to try to be more self-sufficient and sustainable. In addition to canning beets, which you know, I got a reasonable amount of beets this year. As I said, I didn't get a whole lot from the community garden. Um, I got mostly from mostly from the home garden. But these are Chioga beets, which are pink-ish more so. Uh, this is pickled beets canned here. You can kind of see the stripes on them. Yeah, they were really beautiful. Actually, I, mm, I think that those photos were lost too that I took with it. However, I did send them to a friend, so I might be able to save those photos. If so, I'll share them with you in a moment. Here's a photo I took when I was going to roast some of these beets. I just think those circles are so pretty, aren't they? And then um, I've been saving the beet greens from the beets from my garden because they have a huge amount of nutrition to them. They can be used in soups and other things, but I like to dehydrate them and then make a powder, you know, blend them up once they're dehydrated and make a powder. And so this is probably like the equivalent of like 24 beet plants in here, maybe more than that. So those leaves, you don't do the stems, you just save, dry the leaves. Um, the leaves actually don't make up a lot of space, but I put a spoonful of this in my shakes and honestly, I don't taste it. I don't taste it at all. It doesn't add earthy flavor. It doesn't really do anything to it. A small spoonful really doesn't make a difference and you're getting all kinds of nutrition and you, you know, you're making full use of your garden, which is really a great idea if you can not, you know, and composting is great. Like I compost a lot, but if you can actually get it into your body and give you the nutrition from the things that you grow, that's even better in my opinion. All right, so uh, let's head outside and I'll show you how things are going out there. This is the current view of my home garden. And aren't these black eyed Susans just stunning? I mean, they're so beautiful. They really are. I love black eyed Susans and I, this is from three plants that I planted winter sowed last year. <laughs> and then um, back here in this little corner here, I'll get closer with the camera, but there is a butterfly weed, which is native to the area and helpful to monarch butterflies. Here we go. Get a nice close up of the butterfly weed. And then in this part of the garden where I had the garlic before, I have planted edamame. You can see that they're starting to sprout. I planted them about 10 days ago. Uh, eight or nine days ago actually. I also started some Brussels sprout uh, seeds inside. They haven't started sprouting yet otherwise I'd show you but the edamame are getting going. Um, it won't be enough to can or anything like that but um, I love edamame and uh, I'm really looking forward to having that this fall. Look at this gorgeous coxcomb here. Oh. And then we have volunteer zinnia on the front and I'm not getting rid of it because this is really a beautiful like light pink color with sort of a white center. It's really a pretty zinnia. I can't forget the beautiful coxcomb that are developing here. We have this coral um, nymph. Uh, I forgot what they're called all of a sudden. <gasps> Mr. Bumblebee, are you enjoying the flower? Okay, Mr. Bumblebee. We have, these are the container zinnias. They do have some rust disease issues, but they are doing okay overall. We have the red garnet amaranth in the back and an orange zinnia, which is great. I love orange. The container sunflowers are done, but look at this beauty. I got to get closer to this one. <gasps> this is a teddy bear sunflower. Yay! Look how fluffy it looks. It looks so fluffy, doesn't it? I just love it. Look at this gorgeous echinacea. The bees, the butterflies, they love it. 
and it's just going gangbusters. We still have more blossoms coming. I've brought them inside. They last forever inside. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to, this is the second year. I winter sowed them two years ago. So this is their second year. They bloomed the second year. All right, so now to the community garden. This is how it looks at this current time. Look at those beautiful marigolds. They're doing so wonderfully. The garden did really well while I was gone, and I was very grateful for that. Uh, I only had a few plants that were a little bit struggling, but it did rain like a day before I came back, so that helped keep the garden replenished. Let me interject real quick right here to say, in this clip, there's gonna be some sound issues, and I apologize. Um, I think I was speaking a little too close to the mic, so yeah. It still sounds okay, just a little bit uh, over the top on a couple occasions, so bear with me. So here's what was previously the bridal tool bed. I have basically moved all the bridal tool back to just cover this kale plant, which still has some pests in it, you can see, but it's at least keeping them from getting much worse. Uh, we've harvested so much kale, by the way, lately. I uncovered it partly so that this plant, this giant yellow squash plant, could actually get pollinated. I could have come out early in the morning and pollinated it, but re re reality was I just wasn't pollinating it. So there we go. There's the first little yellow squash from this plant. So we'll be getting more. And that actually means it's good because it's healthier than the ones that were out and had been attacked by the vine borer um, the entire time. So maybe it'll help extend the, uh, the time that we have stuff. Over here is the cabbages and what's left of the dill, which I need to harvest these heads. Look at this for, for uh, pickling. And I'm going to harvest this cabbage right here, right now. This one. I've been waiting to do this. I keep meaning to do it. This is a Charmant variety that I grew using winter sowing. I kept covered with bridal tool until about a month ago. Come on. Come on out. There you go. Good girl. The ugly leaves off. Looks like a pretty good head. Got some pest damage there. But I think this will make for a nice little coleslaw for us. I'm gonna put it in here so we don't get dirt in the uh, my crazy plant lady bag. <laughs> my sister's little sunflowers are doing great. The ones she transplanted that I had given up hope on. She trellised them with some stakes yesterday. And she made us this nice path with the wood I got from the neighbor who was taking down his deck. I'm actually gonna use these for beds next year, but for now it's a weed suppression thing and it looks kind of cool. My pride and joy, which means it'll probably get destroyed by bugs, <laughs> is this delicata squash. The vine, I've read you have to wait till the vine um, sort of dries up that connects it to the plant, so I'm waiting for that to happen. But look, the Korean melon is starting to turn colors, which is, I think it's yellow when you harvest it. So I may get a Korean melon out of this, even if I don't get a whole lot. Oh, and there's another Korean melon over here. <laughs> They're kind of fuzzy. We have another white squash, patty pan uh, squash over there. The tomatoes are doing pretty well. Some are struggling. This one looks like it's dying and I'm not sure why. It's probably got some disease. But I'm waiting for the tomatoes to at least ripen. And we've got some turning colors here. This is a Paul Robeson. With my time away, I actually only found so far two tomatoes tomato not tomato plants that had blossom end rot oh. I only had two tomatoes that had blossom end rot from lack of watering and getting the calcium up so uh, everything fared pretty well while I was gone and I think today I'm gonna harvest my first tomato <laughs> this is a green zebra tomato you harvest it when it starts turning green and yellow you don't wait till it gets mushy it's actually quite a firm tomato okay Come on, come off. There we go. Squee! First tomato of the season. Now remember, I'm like two, three weeks behind most others on tomatoes because I took a long time getting them in the ground, but oh, that is an exciting sight. Yes, you are going to be really good with some basil at home tonight. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was supposed to be fertilizing the garden today uh, and I've just run out of time, but the peppers seem to be doing pretty well overall. I was gonna harvest some and I think I will. Let's see, banana pepper. Yeah. 
This is when I need that apron that has that extra pocket. Oh, are these bell peppers big enough yet? Oh no, this one got some sun scald. Uh. The good news is you can still cut out that part and eat the rest of the pepper, which we actually did last night and it was delicious. Let's see how this one's doing. That's better. Okay. We have a purple bell pepper down here too. And here is a nada pino pepper. These are heatless jalapenos. And I think I'm gonna do a taste test, praying that I picked the, from the right plant. I did put the jalapenos that are hot on the other end, so don't laugh at me. <laughs> I'm gonna bite right into the middle of it. No heat. No heat whatsoever. In fact, I would say it tastes like a bell pepper. I wonder if what makes jalapeno so tasty is the heat. Proof. No heat whatsoever. Hmm. It's good though. Picking some jalapenos. Look at this gorgeous love light, the coral amaranth, uh, coral fountains amaranth. Isn't that stunning? It's so pretty. Purple, I think it's called, well, purple seeing but I can't remember what they're called at the moment. It's threatening to rain and it is humid, about the most humid I've ever felt it. Uh, in this area. I really can't handle being in the garden today. It's too much for me. It's not even sunny. It's just the humidity level. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to watch as I update on how things are going and uh, I'll see you next time.